It is the 13th of August, 2011, in Indiana, USA. And there's an excitement in the air as a crowd eagerly awaits the headline act of an open-air concert. It is the country band called Sugarland. They are scheduled to start at 2045, but the weather has other ideas. Management and officials for the gig have been discussing whether the show could start as a storm is coming in. If cancelled, it would be disappointment for the audience and refunds may be asked for. Maybe a delay could work. But with the storm predicted to hit at 21.15, delaying to let it pass would cause issues for the band's tour schedule. Instead, just a small delay, but before the storm's predicted arrival. At least they can do some of the show, as such the audience are assured that they will see the band play, and thus they wait. However, before the band had a chance to begin playing, the stage collapsed, smashing down into the audience. Many would lose their lives that night. But was it just an act of God, as Sugarland's lawyers would later assert, or something much more in line with a plainly difficult video? Well, watch to find out. My name is John, and let's get into the Indiana State Fair stage collapse. background. Now, when I think of a fair, often over here spelt as F-A-Y-R-E, something like the Keston Village Fair comes to mind. There's like a raffle, chance to meet a hedgehog, some live music, and it's a rather small one-day affair. But that barely compares to something like the Indiana State Fair. Multiple days of fun and a permanent fairground. The Indiana State Fair is somewhat of an institution. It's ran in various forms since 1852, making it one of the oldest state fairs in the United States. The fair has been home to various venues over the years, but since 1892, it has been held here in Indianapolis, which is here on this map. The site sports the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum, a 6,500-seat multi-use venue as well as multiple pavilions for exhibitions and indoor events. The site over its long life has seen disaster. In 1963, an explosion ripped through the Colosseum, taking 81 lives. This has recently just been suggested to me as a future video, so let me know in the comments if you would like me to cover this disaster as well. Each year, the better part of 1 million people visit the fair during its 12 to 18 day length. As a side note, and for today's video, the length had increased over time, and in 2011, which is where our video will focus, it was a 17-day long event. Musical acts regularly play the festival. It's a mix of nationally well-known acts, local acts, and the odd international act. Even the Beatles played at the fair in the 1960s. But for today, we're going to focus on, as I mentioned before, the 2011 season. There was a permanent concrete stage across from the Hoosier Grandstand, along the track straightaway. In between the two was an 85-foot wide raceway track. This, during concert season, made for a perfect music venue to accommodate a few thousand spectators. On top of the concrete stage, every year a temporary structure was constructed. This was known as the Indiana State Fair structure. It was an aluminium lattice superstructure comprising multiple prefabricated truss sections manufactured and designed by James Thomas Engineering, which manufacturing took place over the years of 1995 to 2010, which kind of makes sense as it was a modular system that could be added to and taken away depending on your needs. The owners and erectors of the roof and rigging system were Mid-America Sound Corporation, They were contracted each year to build a temporary structure over the concrete stage area. The structure had multiple columns of various widths, with a height of around 46 feet. On top of this, the structure sat the main trusses. On top of that were the gable trusses in which the roof sat, made using slope rafter trusses, which had a north-south running ridge truss. Overall, this was a tarp roof which helped offer some protection from the rain. The sound system was permanently attached to the main structure during the festival season. However, Anax could add some of their own lighting rigs to the stage. To prevent lateral load failure, 14 guy lines made of steel wire ropes were used. 
They were connected to the structure through one inch thick aluminium plates, which were then attached to 10 jersey barriers and are then tensioned with ratchet straps. These jersey barriers are pretty much large concrete blocks that look like something that would stop traffic, with attachment loops built in, and they weighed roughly 1.9 tonnes each. They weren't mechanically attached to the floor, instead relying on friction and their sheer weight not to move. They could withstand winds up to 25 to 43 miles an hour, although this wasn't known at the time and would be calculated after our disaster. But building codes required a structure like the one installed at the Indiana State Fair to be able to withstand of winds of a minimum of 68 miles an hour. The effects of wind are very important as they are the greatest lateral load a structure like this can endure. However, during installation of the stage, columns and roof, no licensed engineer undertook a survey of the completed structure, and the State Fair didn't ask for proof of one either. As such, the limitations on the stage's wind resistance were not really known by anyone, which would be concerning at the best of times, let alone when a storm is predicted to come in. The disaster. It is the 13th of August 2011 and the fair is roughly halfway through its 17 day run. The evening's entertainment headliner is the country band Sugarland. Personally I've never heard of them but hey what do I know. The band are set to go on at 2045 but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. We need to wind back to 12 hours earlier when the loading of the Sugarland equipment began and this included the attachment of their lighting rig to the temporary structure. At around 3pm the sound check began and doors opened for ticket holders at 6.30pm. Support act Sarah Barry Ellis was scheduled to start at 19.30. Meanwhile the National Weather Service's Storm Prediction Centre issued a severe thunderstorm watch number for central Indiana. The warning informed that the storm was capable of producing wind gusts of up to 70 miles an hour. The storm moved across central Indiana towards a state fairground. By 7pm, more severe weather reports started coming in. Sarah Barry Ellis came on stage and began her set. Meanwhile, the event organisers were beginning to understand that the incoming storm was in fact going to hit the fair. Now, the next few parts of the story are disputed amongst the parties and this was the decision to carry on or not with the show. A meeting was held between state fair officials about delaying the 8.45 start time. Sugarland's managers, who had apparently not been told of the incoming winds but just of rain, relayed a message to the organisers that the show should carry on as normal but can be cut short if the weather gets worse. The storm was predicted to reach the site at 21.15. As such, the decision was made to go ahead with the show, at least starting with the potential to end it early, but the storm was going to hit much sooner than predicted. A state fair official spoke to the state police captain Brad Weaver, who was seeing the incoming wings. He explained that the headliner act had to be delayed and the stand cleared. The official for the fair seemed to agree, but somehow this agreement wasn't actually acted upon. Brad Weaver would later say in an interview with the Indiana OSHA, The official knew how I felt about this, which is that we should move people out of the stands. I fully understood that we were going to move people out of the stand. Bizarrely, rather than a full-blown evacuation, the announcer came onto the stage and said to the crowd this rather poorly aging announcement. As you can see to the west, there are some clouds. We are all hoping for the best that the weather is going to bypass us, but there's a very good chance that it won't. So just a quick heads up before the show starts. If there is a point during the show where we have to stop the uh, show on stage, what we'd like to have you do is calmly move towards the exits and then head across the street to either the Champions Pavilion, the Blue Ribbon Pavilion, or the Pepsi Coliseum. And then, once the storm passes and everything's safe, we're going to try our best to come back and resume the show, which we have every belief that that's going to happen. So please get ready, because in just a couple of minutes, we're going to try and get sure to land on stage. Have a great show. This was at 8.45pm. Some of the crowd left the area, but most stayed anticipating the headlining act to come on. This would be a fatal decision for several. Just a few seconds after the announcement, at 8.46pm, a large gust of wind hit the stand. 
audience members were now trying to escape and started moving away from the grandstand. Looking facing the stand, it began to lean over towards the right. The jersey barriers began to slide under the lateral force and the structure began to collapse. Audience directly in front of the stage began fleeing the area, but in just mere seconds the whole structure had crashed towards the right hand side of the audience, crushing into those not fast enough to escape. Four would be killed instantly, three more would be severely injured, which would result in their deaths later in hospital. As emergency workers rushed in to help, a further 58 would be treated for various injuries. At just after 9pm, the Marion County coroner was called to the collapse, and shortly after, power was cut to the stage. The search for any trapped individuals then commenced, and sadly at 11.27pm, the search was completed with no more people found alive. Understandably, the collapse would garner nationwide attention, which would need to be investigated, and this leads us on to the aftermath section of this video. The aftermath. Almost immediately after the collapse, an investigation was announced, and a company was selected as reported by CNN. The State Fair Commission is hiring New York-based engineering company Thornton Tomasetti, Incorporated, to investigate Saturday's deadly stage collapse, officials said on Tuesday. Interestingly, this company was one of those involved in the 9-11 investigation. Investigators would pour over the wreckage and interview witnesses and state fair officials. But not only Thornton Tomaselli would be peeking into the disaster, but also Indiana's branch of OSHA. Interviews would quickly discover the reluctance of officials and band management to delay the show. Ultimately, it would be down to the show's organisers as who would take final responsibility for the lack of delay or cancellation of the show. But we'll look into this a little bit later when we talk about the legal proceedings. But how was it that the stage could have collapsed under winds in the first place? Well, investigators discovered that the wind speed on the night was estimated to be around 59 miles an hour, far below the requirement of 68 miles an hour as per code. The Jersey barriers were discovered to have moved, in many cases on the western side of the stage. They had moved to a point where they offered no lateral resistance. Investigators ran calculations on the structure and discovered that it was poorly designed and poorly installed. But even if the ballast system of the Jersey barriers had not failed, it was also discovered that the steel guy ropes were inadequate for the task. The report released on the 3rd of April 2012 set out 16 key findings putting the blame on the designer, James Thomas Engineering, builder, Mid-America, and the Indiana State Fair Commission for not having the proper records, documentation, plans, engineering reports, or related technical data. It would seem that everyone involved in building that stage was kind of just winging it. Eventually, a settlement of $50 million in damages would be agreed upon, with the state of Indiana settling were paying 11 million of this, and the other defendants, including Knife Nation and Sugarland, settling for paying the remaining balance of the 50 million award, which was 39 million dollars. Interestingly, Sugarland initially claimed that they had no lawsuit to answer to due to the audience deciding to stay in the venue during the storm, saying, Some or all of the plaintiffs claimed injuries resulted from their own fault which I'm not going to lie, is not really a very good look for the band. But a benefit for us, I suppose, is that I get to tick off the victim blaming portion of my bingo card. Right, so it is now scale time. I'm going to give it a free on my slightly improved disaster scale. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. This is a plain different production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Licensed. Plainly Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a very warm the South London 26 degrees. I have a second YouTube channel and Instagram, and the links of that will be in the pinned comment. As well as I'd like to say a very lovely warm thank you to my YouTube and Patreon members for your financial support. That really helps pay for things like image licenses and all the important stuff that's required for me to run this channel. And all that's left to say is thank you for the rest of you for tuning in every week and Mr Music Man, please play us out 
and thank you all for watching.